Welcome to Circle City Conversations. Thank you for joining me for our conversation today. Thank you to our uh, sponsor, Hearst Lamontes, an Indiana law firm representing Hoosiers and their families. We launched uh, episode one a couple of months ago with Mark Lopez, and since then we've had some great guests and conversations. I'd like to thank everyone for their continued support. I'm here with the award-winning executive director of the Indianapolis Bar Association for 30 years now, right? Miss mm -hmm. uh, Julie Armstrong, thank you for being here, Julie. Thanks for asking me. Thanks. I, I really appreciate it. You bring a lot of um, experience uh, and knowledge in the legal field because you've kind of seen it all here in Indy over the last <laughs> 30 years, right? Um, you could say that. I mean, yeah, I had the pleasure of being able to to be part of this legal community and work with a lot of amazing, interesting people. So, so yeah, I've seen it. Um, so before before we before we get into the indie bar and everything, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about you. Where are you from originally? So, I actually grew up in Franklin, Indiana, so just south of here. Um, spent my whole childhood um, in Franklin and then um, stayed in Indiana to go to college. So went to Indiana State um, back in the day. Um, it only ended up at Indiana State because I decided IU was maybe a little bit too big for a girl from Franklin. <laughs> um, and my older brother was at Ball State, so I wasn't going to go anywhere he went. And my father uh, was very clear that no dollar he ever made was going to be spent at Purdue University. So, uh, and, you know, state college was the thing that was affordable. So that's how I ended up at ISU. But it worked out all right. Met my husband there and and um, and I enjoyed it. It was good. So Bob went to Indiana State? Yeah, Mr. Armstrong. Um, we met. So both of us were really active. Um, go figure. Social people. Um, but... Um, I was really active. I joined a Greek organization, Zeta Tau Alpha, um, and we both were doing the bike race together. And um, he had just finished being president of Pi Kappa Alpha. I was president of Zeta, and we wanted something to do and decided to do the bike race for our organizations at the same time. And so that's how we met, is coaching and riding tandem bikes at Indiana State. That's funny. 37 years ago. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, you know, that's probably why you're so good at your job. I, I was the philanthropic chair for, for beta theta pi and it was like herding cats <laughs> trying to get these guys to volunteer, you yeah. know, to build a house or something in the community. Women are better. Let me tell you, women, women are, are very organized when it comes to their volunteer work in, in college. My son is at the university of Louisville right now and he joined a Greek organization Listening to him talk about trying to get his fraternity brothers to do things versus listening to his older sisters when they were both in Greek organizations. I'm like, yeah, I remember that. I remember the guys chasing each other and the, and the girls. You know, we have, I guess, just more guilt or something. We we right. we feel more compelled to have to do so. It's That's so definitely funny. different. Yeah, we did. Uh, I I had the first and only, I think, uh, car bashing fundraiser at Hanover. Oh yeah. So we brought in this car. And I had, I had gotten really sick the day before, and I wasn't there when it was delivered. And then the next morning, I went out there to start getting ready for everything. And those guys had already gone out there and bashed in the hell out of that car. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that a personal injury attorney did a fundraiser where everyone bashed a car. It's, it's, like, it's like foreshadowing somehow of right. your, your future. Little did I know I'd be a personal injury lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um all right, so and high school, where'd you go to high school? So Franklin Community High School, Grizzly Cubs, Go Cubs. Um, so yeah, all, all, uh, all four years. And you know, honestly, it was a great place to grow up. Um, my mom's still down there. Um, thank goodness, I still have my mom. But um, Franklin, when I grew up in Franklin now, very different environments. Franklin actually is a pretty great place to be right now. If you haven't gone down to Franklin and walked the courthouse square and gone to the little restaurants and shops. And they have a whole like chamber of commerce movement down there. I think it's called discover downtown Franklin. They have festivals. They've got an amphitheater. And wow. Franklin, if, if I were a young professional looking for a place to go, I'd look at Franklin. 
Yeah. That's and it's great. and it's not that far from downtown. No, it's an easy drive up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you graduated uh, from Indiana State. You were mm-hmm. uh, tr- Go Trees, right? Go Trees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got there right after Larry Bird. Um, so people, I'm like, how old do you think I am? But I mean, I'm <laughs> older, but I'm not that old. But um, yeah, there, it wasn't like we had great sporting events. Yeah. Um, and it's like D2 and football, D1 and, and basketball, but mm-hmm. um, it's just a right size campus. And I wanted to major in communications. I have a good um, public relations program at, at ISU, so I still do. Um, so, yeah, so I ended up down there doing that. And like I said, did a lot of stuff on campus and met some really interesting people. And then when I um, was looking for an internship, I ended up taking an internship with the Indiana Senate and working as a legislative aide um, and doing communications work um, in session back in the day, um, worked for a couple senators. And then from that ended up, believe it or not, got a job with my sorority. So Zeta yeah. Tawafa became an assistant executive director of the international headquarters, which is here in Indy. Um, so I could just come back here and got to travel and, do a lot of great things. So between the the work at the Senate and then the work at the fraternity, um, you know, by that point I'd had my first child and living in sorority houses, helping sorority girls with their issues when you get a baby at home, just seemed like maybe it was a good time to step away from Zeta. Um, so I started looking to see what else, you know, was out there and what the next step might be. And the um, the Bar Association was looking for somebody to do continuing education programming. And part of my job at Zeta was organizing the um, conferences and the conventions. So um, knew a bunch of lawyers from Johnson County and then from the work at the Senate. So um, a couple of people vouched for me and applied. And um, and I didn't get the job. <laughs> and so I you know, went on with life. And um, the Tuesday after Memorial Day one year, the phone rang and the person that they hired um, was supposed to show up for work that day. And instead, they got a letter in the mail saying that she had changed her mind. And so they asked if they could take me to lunch and um, offered. And they told me at the outset, you know, when I didn't get the job that I was second choice. So when they called me, they told me what had happened and said, would I still be interested in taking the job? Um, But they needed somebody ASAP. So... Um, I think I gave notice the next day and started exactly two weeks later. And I've been there ever since and just worked into the director's role. And, and there's a lot of similar, I guess, fair to say there's a lot of event planning that goes on in what you do now. Um, yeah, I, I'm more, um, I'd say the sounding board and sometimes quality control. So we have a full-time, um, staff of three who do nothing but plan events and meetings okay. and so forth for us. Um, so I work with them. So I I know what I don't want us to do um, based upon the strategic plan that the board has for the organization um, and sort of the look and the feel of who I think that we're supposed to be. Um, so I kind of k- gatekeep on those aspects, but the the day in day out logistics of the various events we do, I don't get involved in that, but we do, about 250 programs a year. Oh, wow. um, so it takes a, a, it takes a team to get it done. And, you know, back in the day when I first got to the, the bar, we, so I got there in 1991, we had um, six full-time staff people and a budget of a little over half a million dollars um, and uh, about 1900 members. Mm-hmm. Um, and at our largest now, we've been at $2.1 million on the association budget, um, 11 full-time staff members, and um, we'll do, uh, like I said, like 250 programs um, for f- about maximum, f- I think we were at 5,600 5, members. Um, there are fewer lawyers now. So yeah. our numbers are a little less, not a little less, they're less than that because um, there just aren't as many lawyers practicing as there were 10 years ago. Yeah. So, which is a blessing and a curse. Right. So um, <laughs> it's just different. But um, but we have the association, which I act as executive director for it. 
But then we also have a foundation that does charitable work, um, helping people get access to law-related services, um, particularly people with limited means. Um, and so the foundation has its own board that we work for in its own budget. So okay. it brings in about $500,000 a year. Okay. Um, and then between um, grants and scholarships and so forth, we're sending out about 200000 of the 500000 um, the rest of it is either direct expenses because um, we we don't really have much overhead. Um, the association pretty much absorbs almost all the overhead for the foundation in terms of staffing and and um, rent and those kinds of things. Sure. Um, but then just you know general operational costs that are cost of doing business. Um, so they're pretty efficient with their money. So that's that's how we spend our time between the association and the foundation, um, trying to get money out in the community and provide services. So, so, so yeah, let's talk about that where there's two separate entities, right? The Indianapolis bar association mm -hmm. and, and the Indianapolis bar foundation, right? Right, right. So two completely different business entities, um, but with companion purposes, um, and they do work really closely together. Um, but they have different missions. So the association's mission really is to serve lawyers and okay. members of the legal community. And if we do that right, then the lawyers are out serving the larger community. Um, the foundation is a way then for those lawyers to serve the larger community. So the foundation's mission is to um, support the administration of justice um, and it says, and to lead positive change, which just means we're committed to doing good, positive things in philanthropy and education and in general service. So um, the, the foundation is going to do things like um, free legal advice um, clinics, or we have a program right now called the Virtual Help Desk. So if you went on, and this is the companion relationship, if you went on the Indie Bar website, indiebar.org, and... Um, you know, open up the page, a little box is going to pop up in the lower right hand corner and say, and it'll say, do you have a legal question? And there are lawyer volunteers who are manning that service all day long during business hours. So that if you type in a question, there is a lawyer sitting at their desk somewhere right now, waiting to hear a sound that somebody just sent them a question and they hop on and they'll just chat with you and answer your questions. And, and oftentimes what ultimately is going to lead to is yeah, you probably do need to talk to a lawyer. Yeah. Um, and I say oftentimes, because there are many times when you don't need to talk to a lawyer and they'll tell you that, you know, this is an, an issue where you should hire someone. There's a either a social service agency or I can tell you that there it, this is not a legal problem. There, mm -hmm. there, It would be a disservice to you to try and hire somebody and pay someone money to to address this issue, it's not a legal issue. So they're very honest about it, but sometimes they do say, yeah, you need to hire somebody and here are some resources yeah. for you to find someone. They will not say hire me, um, that it's not that kind of relationship. They're there just to provide service, but the foundation makes that virtual help desk on that website possible. Okay. They help pay for the technology. Yeah. The people that are answering the questions are volunteering. They're not yeah. getting anything uh, other than just feeling good about the fact they help somebody. Right. But the association provides that conduit then with the, the website and all the infrastructure to make that happen. So that's that companion relationship. And so as a staff then, we try to provide the support by um, recruiting the people to, to provide the information um, by making certain that the technology is working correctly, um, the marketing so that the public even knows that the, the help desk is there. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do all those kinds of things while the lawyers that are staffing it are helping the public. Yeah. And that is the mission of the association. We help the lawyers, the lawyers help the public. Okay. And so, that, that help desk. So if someone gets a question that's kind of outside of their practice area, if they're a lawyer, do they get like a guidebook or something? Yeah. So that's another thing that the foundation does. It's called the Commonly Asked Questions about Indiana Law. So, um, and we call it the CAQ book, but um, it's updated annually. The new one's getting ready to come out. 
Um, and it's a resource book so that, you know, like for instance, you know, public or a, a personal injury attorney, you get a question about divorce. I will tell you, if you practice law for any period of time, the complexity of most of the questions that we get is just low enough that you probably do know the answer to at least get somebody pointed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you can open up the CAQ book and it'll give you more information um, so that you can at least be a bit more conversant with the person, but you're still going to tell them you probably need to talk to someone who does family law. But if nothing else, like I always look at it from the standpoint, if I were the person on the other side, I I will find comfort that I talk to a true professional who, Mm -hmm. who can at least give me some guidance. Um, You know, if anybody asks me, so I don't practice law, my background's communications. um, And that helps me stay focused on serving the people I'm supposed to serve um, instead of trying to serve the public. Right. I'm Mm -hmm. supposed to serve the lawyers. Um, But you know, when people press me, Oh, but you should, you probably know you, you know, you've worked for lawyers for 30 years. You probably know the answer to this. I always tell people, go next door and ask your neighbor because the quality of the legal advice you're going to get from your neighbor is going to match what I can do for you. (laughs) There is a reason why people go to law school. Law is complex and you want somebody who really knows what they're talking about and they will know just how far they can go. Yeah. And when they've reached the maximum, they will tell you that. And they do the same thing on the virtual help desk. Yeah. Yeah. And I will tell you as the recipient of one of those CAQ books. They do have a lot of great information Mm -hmm. in there. So, Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, we talked about the bar association kind of generally the, the bar foundation, does the bar, uh, association, do they do any legislative type work? We do, but it's limited on for the Indianapolis bar association. So in Indiana, there are a number of bar associations and um, Indiana is, is a little unique. In 36 states, the State Bar Association is a governmental entity. Mm-hmm. Um, in Indiana, it is not. There are no organizations in Indiana with the name Bar Association that are governmental in any way. In Indiana, every bar association is a voluntary group, organization, or club, however you want to look at it, um, meant to serve law, lawyers, um, law-related activities. So the Indianapolis bar, we will do some activity over at the state house or um, here locally in the city county council, uh, but it has to be very specific to the practice of law, extremely specific to the practice of law and specifically to those practicing in um, Indianapolis based courts. Okay. Um, The Indiana state bar association, which is a great organization, they focus more activity on advocacy work at at the state house than we do. And because they do such a great job at what they do, we don't have to do as much. Um, We really can kind of stay in our lane and be very local in our focus because they're working really hard to be very um, broad in the needs of Indiana lawyers. They're also um, Defense Trial Council of Indiana and the Indiana Trial Lawyers Association. So those are two organizations that are specific for defense attorneys and plaintiffs attorneys. They also do um, work over the state house, particularly Trial Lawyers Association, which you know, I mean, yeah. you're active um, with ITLA. Um, because those organizations are as strong as they are, we can be really picky about where we spend our time on advocacy, but we do do some of it. Yeah. Um other things that the bar association offers to its members like practice builder. Oh yeah. Like so, that. so Indy bar, what we try and do try and focus our efforts in three areas, right? So we're going to try and do services and programs that help people be more productive, um, be more profitable, which doesn't mean we want to help you make a whole bunch of money. We just want you to be smarter about how you spend your time and your money. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if we're doing that right, then we're going to help you find a little bit more enjoyment in the journey. Um, so, um, we always call it, um, helping lawyers feel less stressed. Um, so, um, the things that we do are focused in those three areas. So we'll do, Delivery services, law practice management services like Practice Builder, which is a tool to help people 
manage their practice in an efficient manner. So lawyers go to law school to learn the law. You don't go to law school to figure out how to run a business. Right. <laughs> and so unfortunately, a lot of people are, are coming out of law school expecting or expected to go out and start serving the public, but you got to set up your business first. So we have Practice Builder um, and then Indie Lawyer Finder set up specifically to help people be better about the business of law. Um, so Practice Builder is all about just that, everything about running a small business that is focused on the delivery of legal services. And then Lawyer Finder, which is a way for people to find you in a really big legal environment. So it's a web-based um, tool for you to search for a lawyer. And so lawyers can can get on Indie Lawyer Finder to help promote their individual practices. The beauty for the public is because we're the Bar Association, we make certain that you are not on our service if you are not in good standing with the Indiana Supreme Court. If you have had any problems with delivery of services in an ethical and efficient manner with your clients, you cannot be in Lawyer Finder. Um, it, you, the only way you could get back onto Lawyer Finder is if you satisfy our board of directors that whatever issues you had no longer exist. Um, okay. So so Lawyer Finder is a really good way for the public to feel confident that um, at least fellow lawyers are comfortable with the level of service that you're providing to the public. In my experience, I will tell you, there's nobody harder on lawyers than other lawyers. Yeah. Where some might think, oh, they're all in it together, you know, take the pessimistic view. No, the, the first person that wants to get a bad lawyer out is a lawyer. Yeah. Um, because they make everybody look bad. So, exactly. so it's, it's one of the, I think, the most heartening things that the bar does is provide that kind of oversight. And we do that. So um, there's a group within the bar, it's called the grievance committee. So if the, if the public has a problem with a lawyer, there is a process that you can go through. Um, the Indiana Supreme Court has a, a group called the Indiana Disciplinary Commission that invest, they investigate complaints from the public about lawyers. And they also investigate complaints from lawyers about other lawyers too. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> excuse me, the The process is if you file a complaint, they will um, at times reach out to the local bar, and in this case, the Indianapolis bar, if it's an Indianapolis area attorney, and ask for assistance in investigating that complaint. And so we have volunteers who work in a very confidential manner and confidential to help the client, not the attorney, and investigate those <clears throat> excuse me, investigate those complaints and then turn over their findings to the disciplinary commission. So we do that as well. Oh, okay. So the, the Indie bar, I mean, it's a nationally recognized organization. Yes, yes it's, it is. Yeah. Why? Why? Um, you know, I've, I've thought about this off and on because the bars actually in my time at the bar won a lot of awards and gotten a lot of recognition, um, from the American Bar Association and from others to be known as a very entrepreneurial, um, innovative environment. And I really think it's because of where we are. We don't, I mean, we take it for granted that people volunteer the way that they do because it's just the culture of where we live. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not the norm. I mean, where people will jump in and say, what can I do? How can I help? Um, you know, be willing to fold letters, uh, make phone calls, uh, you know, direct traffic, you know, mm -hmm. you know, do, do whatever. What I see instead in many areas, volunteers are more than, more than happy to come in and give you benefit of knowledge and wisdom, but energy and time that's harder to come by, but not in our, our locality, right? Yeah. Indianapolis, and really, I think the state of Indiana, we're volunteers. We just, we do what we do. And so I think we're more high functioning, which al has allowed us to get the kind of recognition that we do. Um, because where I said earlier that we have 11 staff members, well, we have 11 paid staff members, but I have more than a thousand members who will happily help us with anything that we ask for help. Um, 
you know, that I took for granted for a while until I started talking to uh, people who do what I do in other areas where they considered themselves to be what they called um, a staff driven organization. Yeah. Where um, the Indianapolis Bar is a very member driven organization. Um, I, you know, I work with members on just about every single thing I do each day. I, I really don't touch a project and neither do um, any of my team members without a, an attorney or a paralegal or a law student helping us with some aspect of everything. Yeah. And that I think has helped us do more and be more and we get more recognition for it. I think if you ask the folks at the Indiana State Bar Association, they tell you the same thing. Yeah, they they get the same level of support. Um, all the bars in Indiana do, um, and and we're we're just really fortunate that way. Yeah, different legal atmosphere. Very much so, yeah. and very um, supportive of each other. There, I mean, you're you're always going to have a a level of competitiveness. We even have it within the bar associations yeah. because people only have so much time and money and focus to give. Um, and so you always need to be making the case for why me, right? Same thing, you know, you could hire this lawyer or hire that lawyer, why me? Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes down to it, I think when people make decisions about hiring lawyers, it's the same thing about how they make decisions on where to spend their time and money um, for an organization like a bar association. I think it comes down to relationships. Where do you feel that you have the the most beneficial relationship because um, you you don't have I don't know I, I think you don't have the the freedom of time and money to be wrong right, right. and so yeah. a lot of the decisions that you make are just based on your gut and so it comes down to relationships and so I'd like to think our bar that we work really hard at making certain that we're not just doing work, but we're in friendship with the people that we're working with. Um, when I interview people um, to join our team, I always tell them, you know, we're with each other more than we're with our families. A normal work week, because um, we're a forward facing group, we come to the office almost every single day. Um, and so if you're not having fun, yeah. if you're not getting to work with people, instead you're having to work with people, why are you doing it? And I don't right. want anybody that works with us, whether it's somebody that's on the paid staff or a volunteer to ever feel like there isn't joy in the journey. And, and I think that that helps underscore why we hopefully have been a little more successful than some. Yeah. So, yeah, we try. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about the current state of the legal profession, kind of what you've seen from your perspective, what, do you think are some of the current trends and challenges facing the legal profession? Oh gosh, it's changed a lot. Um, it was already changing before COVID, but COVID just accelerated, I think, overdue change. I can remember there's this book, it's called Tomorrow's Lawyers by a gentleman named Richard Suskind. And he actually wrote the book for people thinking about going to law school. Have you ever read this thing? No. It's a really short read. I literally read it because I, I was on a really long layover on a flight one time and I read the whole thing in the airport. Um, but it, it was supposed to kind of lay out for you where has the law been and where is the law going? And are you sure this is right for you? And um, essentially what he was saying is the model of the practice of law is largely unchanged since the 40s. 40s is when they really went from being um, sort of the bespoke practice to embracing the billable hour. And, you know, it wasn't just about your intellect. It was about, you know, turning of clients and, Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And so, you know, he's saying, look, it, look at every other industry and how much industries have evolved since the forties, but look at law, law is still firmly rooted in this fairly antiquated billing system. Yes. Um, And so the other way to do it, right, is either be project based, which in many ways that's personal injury work, right. Um, Or, you just commoditize all of your product. So um, if if I'm going to write a contract for you, you know, I, I've i learned through efficiency, it should take X number of 
hours to do this. Therefore, I can charge you a flat rate of this. Okay. Lots of folks don't want to commoditize their practice because it they believe it diminishes the, yeah. the quality or perceived quality of their intellect and therefore their work product, right? Um, so they don't want to commoditize, but you're in a marketplace where most things are commoditized, right? Yeah. Um, so can you embrace the idea that you can be as efficient, as profitable, product, you know, all the things, um, and still preserve that perceived quality of work if you can move to some model of commoditization. So um, COVID for some people forced you to do that um, because the model changed around you. How you had to practice changed. People knew that the way you were practicing changed. And so if ever there was a time to make any kind of shift, it's now when the world seems to be shifting anyway, right? Um, and so watching some of those things happen where, you know, hearings are happening differently because you don't have to go to the courthouse for a 15 minute hearing. You can do it by, you know, Zoom or WebEx or whatever that particular court system is using. Um, you know, the younger lawyers that watch their their friends who are in other industries working 24 um, seven from, from home. And I mean, 24 um, seven, but at least you don't have to get in the car and drive down there. Um, you know, all of those kinds of changes is forcing this shift. What I'm seeing though, and what I'm hearing is that we're starting to bounce back the other way where some of the things that people thought they wanted now aren't serving them so well. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, commoditization, yeah, except that if you get this thing down to, I can do it for $1,200, you got to do that $1,200 thing a lot. Mm-hmm. But if I have to do this $1,200 thing a lot, how do I find clients when I don't leave my house? Yeah. Right. And you got to find a whole bunch of them if you're going to commoditize this work. So, so they don't, their their clients aren't finding them. They don't know each other. Lawyer to lawyer referral is probably, I would consider it, I, and you probably know the, st- the statistics better than I do, but it used to still be in the top three of methods for getting work is lawyer, not, to, lawyer yeah, to lawyer. Not in the personal injury realm. Anymore. Oh, really? Well, because it's it, there's so much marketing. Oh, that's know, true. In the, in the PI space. Um Tons of that's things. true. Yeah. yeah. Last all the, year, all the billboards. Right. And, and TV ads and everything last year in Indiana, the top 10 personal injury law firms spent $22 million combined in marketing and advertising. Holy moly. Right? That's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine, you know, so that's why I like to stay in the digital space because it lends itself more to my clients finding me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but I get the billboards and everything. You be top, you, you top of mind, you know, when yeah. something happens. You know, so. you know, though, what's interesting to me and like, you know, even you doing this, um, this is for me, when people ask me, you know, who should I call or who do you recommend? You know, you, you know, everybody perceives, oh, you know, all the lawyers. Right. I know a lot of lawyers. <laughs> I don't know all the lawyers, but I know a lot of lawyers. For me, I don't understand why people hire people that are not rooted in the community and rooted right. in um, in in law and lawyers here, right? And mm-hmm. I don't want to hire a brand. I want to hire a person. Um, and so doing something like that, this where not only do people get the sense that you really are rooted in the community because you care to talk about the community. Yeah. Um, you know, you're one of the the people that I know um, and I've known for a long time because you've always been in the community since you got here. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't even know how long I've known you. Um, but Many that's years. one of the things that I'm seeing too, is um, these younger lawyers who thought that somebody like somehow it was just going to happen for them are figuring out that they need to know other people. Like I have to come in because not only are they not getting the clients, they're not learning the nuances of law that Mm -hmm. like you, like I know that 
if I came to you and said, I have a question, I'm working this case, have you ever had this experience before? Nine times out of 10, you actually have already had the experience. But if you haven't, you know exactly who I should call. Right. They don't know any of those people. And that's the those are the trends that I've seen that like concern me is trying to reach back and help these people that got disconnected during COVID mm. and reconnect them to resources and relationships and, you know, information because um, they don't they don't have them. Yeah. And, and that's a big concern for me is like this. We just have this dead space that we've got to we got to make up for yeah. that people are only just now starting to figure out. Mm -hmm. And and or you've got big firms where the partner stopped coming to the office, but everybody else kept going. And but the partners were the ones that could have helped everybody, but they weren't accessible. Right. And now they've got to try and get them to come back to the office. Right. So and there's COVID did a lot of good things for accelerating the practice of law. But on the people side, it did some not so great things. Yeah. Do so. you do you think that there's been an impact there as far as member engagement goes with Indie Bar? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're down in engagement, but um, we are not as bad as my colleagues at other bars. Um, and some of it is the younger folks that don't know anybody and don't feel connected. Some of it is that law school class that came in in 20 and the ones that were were in their second and third year. We couldn't we couldn't be in any relationship with them because they weren't even in relationship with each other. Every mm -hmm. class was on Zoom. Nobody knew each other. There was no way to talk to each other. There was no way to reach people when they were at home. And so that those that class from 2020 or actually probably like the class of 2018 the first year class of 2018 to probably next year we're we're going to be trying to find those people for quite some time yeah um and and when i say we i mean every every law related organization across the country because nobody knew any of these people Right. Um, and they don't feel a kinship with anyone. It's kind of like when we had the crash in 2008 and um, employers stopped hiring law school graduates and they kind of felt abandoned by law and everything law related. Mm -hmm. Trying to regain the trust of those folks um, is equal to just trying to even create a relationship with the, the, the COVID folks because um, they don't have any affinity for something they don't even know or right. something they felt was never there for them. Right. It's just different. The, um, so you deal with a lot of lawyers, mm -hmm. right? Lawyers, we all have big egos. That's right. <laughs> no, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah. It, it's not that bad. You guys are better than you think you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I, and I joke with my wife about, you know, cause I do a lot of stuff with the bar association, organizing events and, Sometimes it's like herding cats. Mm -hmm. you know? So on the ego side, how do you deal with a situation where there is either a lawyer or a law firm that has gotten upset by something, either a, 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 a social event or a CLE mm -hmm. or something didn't go the way they wanted? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it doesn't bother me because um, like your name is your entire brand, right? Yeah. And if something has happened that you think does not reflect who you know you are, um, whether it's something we did or didn't do or something that somebody else did or didn't do, um, I understand it because you work really, really hard to yeah. build that trust with that name. Um, and you can't, you, you can't disregard when you feel that something, you know, has, has had a negative impact on that. And so I, don't worry about that. Some people call it ego. I just, I just think it's you just trying to protect something that's important to you. Um, so, so that let's set that aside. I don't, it doesn't bother me a bit. Um, when people are upset, though, um, I just feel like I always tell people in my office our job is to always find a way to make things work. Find a way to 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 make things right. Um, and so 
they hear me say all the time, you can never tell someone no. If somebody calls in and there's a problem or there's a need or whatever, even if you can't do exactly because of limited resources or whatever, you can't do exactly the thing that, that the person needs or that you think the situation requires, you need to come up with a solution. There, You can never just say no or that's just not going to happen. Um, because I don't want that. Like right. if, if I present somebody with an issue, I want to feel like you're in it with me and you're going to help to make that thing happen. And, and it's even easier, I think, for me to look at it that way because I know that the people that I work for, your whole job is to problem solve all day long. You are constantly trying to help somebody and you're taking on the responsibility for someone else's problem. And that is um, just mentally exhausting. Yeah. And and it, so maybe you're presenting to me that, you know, it's ego or it's bluster or it's anger or whatever. Um, I don't do what you do. I mean, I don't, I'm not willing to take on what you've been willing to take on. Um, you know, we've got people who are trying to keep people out of jail that they truly believe shouldn't be there. People that are trying to, to, you know, help in domestic violence situations or a child that's been harmed or, you know, a person that's been catastrophically injured, you know, all these, these are overwhelming needs that they're helping with. And if you're calling me because you're upset about something going on with the bar association, that is not, I mean, I'm not dealing with what you're dealing with. I can, I can manage yeah. that. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we just try and remind people of that, um, you know, and all the things that we do. So it's not ego as much as it's just, we get to work with really smart people who do really important things for other people all day long. Yeah. And that's a great job. Yeah. It just is. Um, so we talked a little bit about, the Bar Foundation. This is this is actually my first year serving on the Bar Foundation board, yeah. um, and and you mentioned some of the things that they do <clears throat> as far as providing legal services mm-hmm. to the community. They do they they do grant writing and stuff like that too. So essentially, what the Bar Foundation is going to do is the Bar Foundation is going to throughout the year try and raise as many dollars as they possibly can through fundraising events and then just asking people to donate checks, right? Um, So that we can do grants for law-related activities. So a lot of the law-related activities are managed by and through the Indianapolis Bar Association. So, And then there also are other organizations that um, do law-related activities in the city. So... Um, organizations like Kids Voice of Indiana, yeah. Indianapolis Legal Aid Society, Indiana Legal Services, those groups also fundraise. But I always um, have had the analogy of the Indianapolis Bar Foundation is like the United Way mm-hmm. of law-related giving, right? So if you don't know who to specifically write a check to, you can always write it to the Bar Foundation because they're always looking for projects to, okay. to serve the community. And so um, it's, it's more of a, a general umbrella mm-hmm. um, rather than a very specific law-related entity. So, um, you know, the Bar Foundation, like right now, today, there are volunteers in a couple of the community centers and at the VA um, doing free wills for people who have wow. limited means. Um, but, you know, they probably need to provide for custody of children or um, they, you know, they want some um, directed um, guidance for family members if they become incapacitated. So we have lawyers who are out donating their time to create these wills at no cost for members of our community. The Bar Foundation, all the costs associated with promoting that program you know, getting printers and, you know, laptops and so forth, um, whatever the volunteers might need, the Bar Foundation pays to make that happen. Yeah. Um, so they'll do that. They do, um, we, we call it um, ask a lawyer. So you can, um, we were going into 
community centers. Then we were going to the libraries where lawyers will just sit across the desk and give you free legal advice. On a day-to-day basis, that's virtual Ask a Lawyer on the website, like I talked about. But we can do special events where we'll go into specific locations and people give give free legal advice, anything that you want to know. Um, They also will do um, scholarships for law students who otherwise um, wouldn't be able to afford to do courses to prepare to take the bar exam, which it's very difficult to pass the bar exam. Um, only about 68% of the people that take the Indiana bar exam pass the Indiana bar exam, even though they've graduated from law school. Right. Um, the bar exam is just a really unique animal where um, it reduces the the information down to multiple choice questions, which if you're a really good lawyer, you should be able to make the argument that more than one of those yeah, <laughs> those right. answers is right. But, right. Uh, but unfortunately, you have to find the very best That's answer. Funny. Um, yeah. but, but we'll help law students prefer, prepare for that, um, bar exam, um, with some scholarships for prep courses. Um, we do, gosh, um, what else? Um, we do other, um, community education programs like the, the, um, commonly asked questions book. Mm-hmm. We do, um, the, the, um, inter- interpretation of information from English to Spanish yeah. for our Spanish speaking neighbors so that they can find the same um, information that English speakers can, um, which is not always easy to do right. um, to find that. So um, there's a, just, you name it, it's out there. The most recent grant that the foundation um, or one of the most recent grants was on um, disability rights, being able to get information out for folks so that they understand what their rights are as a disabled Hoosier. Huh. Um, we've done things where um, Kids Voice of Indiana wanted to put together um, sort of a mobile clinic yeah. and get out into the neighborhoods. So we help fund that. Um, just you name it, it's out there. Yeah. It's, it's really, until you like sit down and really um, focus in on it, you just don't realize all the wonderful things that volunteers are doing, whether it's law related or, or otherwise every single day in this community. Yeah. I mean, right today, just alone today, we probably have 40 volunteers doing something today. Um, and today's a slow day. Yeah. And if you can imagine that, you know, I mean, you know, this a lawyer's time is money, right? It's the only thing we've got. Mm -hmm. Um, at least when it comes to professionally, you know, Mm -hmm. what we can offer and, um, for 40 lawyers to volunteer, you know, you know, two or three hours each. I mean, just imagine those resources, mm-hmm. you know, so. Well, and every, every minute that you guys are working with us is a minute that, you know, you made the decision to, to help this volunteer or this person or, you know, this community <clears throat> member when you know there's somebody that needs your help, right? Mm-hmm. And so we've got to be really careful and um, very respectful of your time because it's in demand and we know it. Yeah. So uh, the Bar Foundation, they do some really cool social events too. We oh, have, gosh. have we have one coming up the the talent show. Let's talk a little bit about well, that. Well, and we just ha- we just were at the Vogue this yeah. morning talking to them. Um, so um, thanks to um, Hearst Lamontes, um, our title sponsor, we'll be hosting a talent show on February tenth at the Vogue, um, and it's Indie Bars Got Talent. And I will admit, we did this program um, in- um, 22. 22, yeah. August of 22. This one's gonna be February 10th of 24. And it was our inaugural talent show, and it's a- absolutely talent from within the Indianapolis legal community. And I admitted it at a board meeting, I thought it was gonna be terrible. I really did. <laughs> I couldn't believe that we were gonna give, you know, this opportunity for people to come out and just completely ruin their professional reputations <laughs> by embarrassing themselves on the stage of the Vogue. But instead, they were really, really good. Yeah. It was so good that at the end of the night, people didn't want to leave because they were like, there's got to be more, right? But, right. and we talked about that this morning and we said, you know, we're going to have the show run a little longer this year because people didn't want to leave when it ended. So um, it, it will have um, around 10 different acts of um, comprised of people from the Indianapolis legal community. And then it's going to be followed by a performance um, by a regional band called an innocent band, um, Mm -hmm. largely a a Billy Joel cover band, but they, they do other music too. Um, But um, they're 
one of their lead singers um, actually is the president of the Bar Foundation next year, Travis Jensen. And they, like I said, they have a regional following. So we should have a number of non-lawyer um, attendees. And um, we told them we'll probably expect around 250, 300 people at the Vogue this year. So it should be great. And it's a really inexpensive ticket. And you can find it on Eventbrite. Um, you know, you can come for a portion of it. You can come for all of it. You have options. But um, it it should be a great night. Would I, I like I said, I was so wrong. It was so good. Yeah. So many amazingly talented singers, um, rappers, um, musicians. I mean, you name it. It was really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Um, so I was there and and you have a you know a judge up there doing kind of a sketch comedy thing you know and then um one of my actually old partners i worked with many many years ago she went up there and sang and some other people that i've known for years and it was it was really entertaining yeah yeah, yeah it, it'll be a great night um and actually the conversation that we were having with the folks at the vogue is just how like how many seats can we get in here because you know, people want to sit down. It's like, it's a longer evening, right? It's about yeah. three and a half hours, four hours. Um, but it's, it goes by fast. It's just amazing how, how great these people were yeah. and are going to be many of, many of the acts that we had in 2022 are coming back. Not all of them. Um, so that we can make room for some, some folks we didn't know about that are equally talented. So, um, should be an interesting lineup. So, but, yeah. but that's February. Um, they also, the foundation has a golf outing, um, mm -hmm. that they sell out every year at country club of Indianapolis. Um, we have, um, just a social, um, sort of a cocktail party dinner that actually is just a party. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a, they call it the gala, which makes it sound stuffy and starchy. It is not, um, not at all. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's just an excuse to get dressed up and come out and have some food and drink and, and just listen to some great music and have a good time. But that'll be, um, next the fall, um, actually at the heirloom, which I had never been to the heirloom. I'd heard about it. And I remember all the discussion when they were building the stadium, um, Lucas oil stadium about the NK Hearst being, building and so mm -hmm. forth and um and they actually have converted that building into an event space that is just beautiful um but it'll be down there it'll be our first time at the heirloom so I'm looking forward to seeing what That's we awesome. can do with that so it should be a good night um the you were a president of the national association of bar executives yeah i, would, I did that, that. So um, NABE, it is um, an organization of around 600 bar association and bar foundation executives from across the country, whether it's um, a state bar like the Indiana State Bar, local bar like the Indianapolis Bar, specialty bar um, like the Women's, uh, Women Lawyers Association, which is a national bar association. So it's all the people who... Um, our professional staff for those groups. Um, so I've been a member of it for a really long time, was on the board for a number of years and ultimately served as president. Um, and of course was serving as president when the world shut down in March of 2020. So that was kind of fun. Um, and I just had a call this morning where we were talking about um, how I was supposed to be hosting um, a conference for this, this association in Chicago um, wow. in March of 2020, when at 1030 at night, my phone rang and it was the staff person for that organization saying, I know we're supposed to be in Chicago and everybody's supposed to be flying in tomorrow, but we've just been notified that the governor of Illinois is going to close the the city and not allow you know, these yeah. kinds of activities to happen. So we're going to have to contact everybody and tell them not to come, even though from what I understood, we already had 20 people that had flown in around the country to arrive early. So, so that was a, a fun experience as their president listening to people. On, and remember, this is just as things are starting to shut down. Um, so the people who thought it was an overreaction completely, who were then not thrilled that I'm telling them with less than 24 hours notice that we're not going to have yeah. this conference and there's no reason to come to Chicago. So that was great timing, but 
you know, what do you do? Um, but yeah, served as president, did a lot of great things um, in terms of like group activity. I didn't do a lot of great things. The group does and trying to provide support services, just like we do with our own bar associations, um, giving people education and networking and um, just sort of a support group so that if you're dealing with whatever issue, just like in law, right, you're not the first person that's dealt with it, but it may just be the first time you've dealt with it. Yeah. So you get resources so that you can help others when somebody else has previously helped you. Yeah. Um, and so it was great um, serving in that role. There's also the, it's called the Conference of Metropolitan Bar Associations, so all the big city bars. Um, so the Indianapolis Bar belongs to that. And I served as president of that for a couple of years. And then there's also the Metropolitan Bar Caucus, which is a group made up of executive directors and um, board members of Metropolitan City Bars. Um, and that's affiliated with the American Bar Association and the National Conference of Bar Presidents. And so I've done that too. So, yeah. but when you've been around a long time, like you end right. up doing things, right? So it's oh, not yeah. that I'm all that great. It's just, <laughs> I was around and it kind of became my turn. I felt like, so I did those things. Yeah. That must be a common bar association thing. If you've been around a long time, you end up doing you things. You end up doing things. Yeah. It's like <laughs> next man up. So, right. I did it. Uh, so, uh, as far as like <clears throat> the, the indie bar and, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, different things that, you know, that they could potentially offer a specific type of person. So we're going to play a little game called what can the indie bar offer you? Oh, All right. Okay. And I'm going to give you three different scenarios, just people. Okay. 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 And you tell me what you think the indie bar can, can offer, offer this okay. individual. Okay. A young lawyer with, less than five years experience wanting to start their own law firm. Oh, that's easy. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do is you wanna talk to me um, or never, another member of our team because we can help you figure out, like if you don't even know where you wanna practice, like where, where should my home base be, we can tell you where it shouldn't be if you want to have, um, the ability to stand out, right? So we can help you pinpoint where the lawyers are. So I, I can show you on a dot matrix exactly where all the offices are and where the offices are not. So we can help you figure out where to hang your shingle, right? Yeah. If you don't want to hang your shingle on your own, we can help you network with people that we know are looking for people, mm -hmm. um, early career professionals. We can do leadership training with you because we specifically have leadership training programs for early career professionals so that you can become known to others, you can become known to other organizations, you can become known to the bar. Because um, at the end of the day, like I said at the beginning, everything's about relationships. Um, so we can help you build those relationships. There are um, some educational programs that you're required to take in the state of Indiana um, that we can help um, get you connected to so that you can keep your license. Um, we can also help you in terms of um, just information on practice management or very specific substantive law information that you might need. The bar also has a really deep um, document library so that if you need forms because you don't know where to start on a certain mm -hmm. given whatever, you don't have to necessarily use the whole form, but it'll at least provide you with a framework so that you can um, have that that file that the more seasoned lawyers have developed over their careers. You don't have that. We do. We can help you with that. Yeah. Um, and then just generally, um, we, we can provide you with just support that you're not the only one. I mean, right. it can be really isolating sometimes. Um, and like we said, taking on other people's problems, um, it, it can take a toll on you just on your general mental health and just talking to people can help. And we're there for that too. Yeah. So. Um, one of the things that I didn't realize when I was in law school was the benefit of the indie bar. I never start. I never did anything really with indie bar until mm -hmm. after. So, to a law student, what can the indie bar offer that person? So, indie bar does a lot of stuff um, at the local law school. So, if you go to 
um, McK Robert H. McKinney School of Law over um, on the campus of um, IUP, still IUPUI, right? Yeah. I said not, not, not yet. Yeah. So um, we can help you in terms of trying to figure out what do I want to do. We do a lot of programs um, under the, the heading of breakfast with the bar. Mm -hmm. um, so we go over there and take lawyers who do everything, right? So one month, it might be that we've got transactional attorneys over there talking to you about what it's like to write contracts all day. Um, or we'll bring people over that do healthcare law or environmental law or sports and entertainment law um, so that you meet people who are doing the work so that you can get more um, in-depth knowledge from them of what is it really like to practice. And then they become a resource to you, somebody in your network and so forth. So we can do that for you. Um, we do bar prep um, yep. so that if you're going to sit for the bar exam, we're the only bar association in the country, Indianapolis Bar, that offers a bar prep course. Um, so um, it's lawyers teaching you what you need to know about the Indiana bar exam, yeah. where I said earlier that um, only about 68% of the people that take the bar exam pass the bar exam. Um, I can honestly say, unless you take our bar review course, um, because people that have, are taking it for the first time that take our bar prep course and sit in our meeting space for every one of the presentations um, our pass rate is closer to 90%. Um, so there's a big value in taking the course and doing it live and showing up for every one of those presentations. Um, those that are trying to do it online, do it sitting at home alone, or the ones that show up every now and then for a live course, it, it's, it's huge that, um, yeah. that exam is so overwhelming and the depth of knowledge that you have to have, you have to make it a job to prepare for that course. Right. And if you do it and you do it with us, we, we can help you pass. And so from a law student, recent graduate perspective, it's the best thing that we do. We just don't have enough kids taking the course. Um, so we do that. Um, we do some just general like social events so that they can get to know lawyers and honestly, so they can kind of get to know each other a little bit better too. A lot of law students, um, they, they don't know anybody else in law school and mm -hmm. there's no network for them. Um, most, the vast majority of law students are um, first generation law students. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to navigate law school, it's unlike, I mean, you know this, right? It's unlike any undergrad experience that you've ever had. Um, so just having those people to rely on that have been there and done that, um, yeah. that's the best thing that we can do for you. Yeah. So so what's next for the Bar Association? So next, um, so all of our leadership is going to change on January the 1st. Um, does every year. So I get a new boss on the association and the foundation side, mm -hmm. um, and then a new board of directors that work with my boss. Um, so those groups have strategic plans. Okay. Um, foundation is, is going into a new phase where they're going to be creating a strategic plan. Um, but I already know what all the goals are for the association for the coming year um, beyond our, our core services. So we're going to be focusing in on things um, that deal with um, pipeline, um, diversity pipeline. Mm -hmm. So law is historically very, very white. Mm -hmm. um, and it, that's changing. It's changing far more dramatically than it ever has before, but it's still very underrepresented in, it, in its general diversity. So we're going to be doing a lot of work on um, trying to make certain that everybody knows that they have a place in the Indianapolis legal community. So we're going to spend in um, a lot of time on that in the coming years, and particularly in this coming year. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about engaging judges. Our courts mm -hmm. moved during COVID, um, so they're outside the downtown area. And because a lot of the um, work that was done in person is now done online for, for court hearings, um, it's really hard for judges to feel that they know the people that they serve in our community yeah. um, and that they know other lawyers. Um, and so the judges really want to work more with the bar so that we can be providing the most efficient court system for our community that we possibly can. So we'll be doing more 
with the judges in the coming year then too from the Marion Superior Court and a little bit more with the other judges, but mostly focused on Marion Superior. Um, so you're going to see a lot of that. Uh, we're going to be doing some stuff too on um, general member benefits, trying to make certain that we're not missing some potential services that um, would benefit our members by asking more questions about what what's your day like? Yeah. What is it like to be you? And how could we help if you're if you're encountering things that are slowing you down or causing you a headache and so forth? So we're going to be doing that. Yeah, we um, this is a little bit off topic, but but talking about events, we were at a uh, retreat and we talked about the costs of some of these things. So so just as a point of reference, you said something about a, a gallon of coffee. What was it? So when we go to a hotel and we're hosting a conference, typically the cost of a gallon of coffee is one hundred and twenty dollars. Oh. Yeah. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, th- this was the one that really got me. Um, we did a specialty conference in Las Vegas last year. Mm-hmm. And normally when we do a conference, they'll put a jug of water in the back of the room. Oh, yeah. I remember this. Yeah. It was five hundred dollars for a jug of coffee or a jug of water in the desert. In the desert, just to put a jug of water in the back, it was going to be five hundred dollars, and and then if they they put it back out the next another five hundred, so a thousand dollars for two days for for water in the room. Yeah, yeah. And I'd never thought anything about that before. We'd never been charged for it, but but yeah, if you borrow, I can. I can buy an, a projector for $500, but if I don't bring my own projector, they charge me $500 to borrow theirs. Right, right. So the cost of doing conferences is and it's not. only And it's, it gets, uh, it, it's only gotten more expensive, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then, you know, it, multi-day conferences anymore, I mean, you don't want to leave home. Right. You know, for something that, you know, is only for a couple hours. So if we're going to do it, we're going to do it overnight. So... It's and, and because a lot of people do want to bring their families and do a getaway and really take a break. Um, but over on accommodations where we used to be able to get rooms for like one hundred and twenty nine to one hundred and fifty nine dollars. Yeah. Now it's like two fifty nine. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not cheap. I was just there's a conference in January down in Miami Beach that mm-hmm. I wanted to go to because it's. January in yes, Miami in Beach. Yes, in Miami Beach, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it was, they, they were at the Lowe's Hotel, and I and I missed, uh, didn't miss the deadline, but the rooms had already sold, sold out. out. The the discounted rate was $400, and the regular rate is $1,200 a night. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. And trust me, I try, I'm trying to do one right now for another organization that I volunteer for, and it's just crazy, the, right. the minimums, the mandatory minimums, but... Hospitality since COVID, everybody wants to travel. So yeah, yeah, if, and you know they can get it. Yeah, so. exactly. So, yeah. Uh, well, speaking of hospitality, your favorite restaurant in Indianapolis? Oh my god, um, Ambrosia on College. Really? Oh my god, you and my partner Bill. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I love Ambrosia. Oh, They're always yeah. very, very nice, and the quality of the food it really does taste homemade. Mm-hmm. And it it's is. just small enough. It's not too big. It's not too small. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Did you like the old location? Yeah, but yeah. I like, honestly, I like this one better. The parking is better. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, but we've, I always like the Ambrosia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and congrats to, to you and your family. Uh, your um, daughter just got married. Yeah, so right. our, our first one to... To get married, I would tell you it was a great weekend. Getting there was a journey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was planning a wedding with a daughter. Oh my goodness! Talk about stressful, right? Yeah. So, so what piece of advice would you give to a parent that is planning their child's wedding? Um, uh, the word anxiety comes <laughs> to mind. Like just manage the anxiety because the thing that especially as an event planner, right? I plan a lot of events. We're planning an event. Um, But remembering that like all the emotional side, I mean, they're excited, but they also have a lot of anxiety because, you know, it's a huge decision no matter how much they love them. Right. I just kept trying to not forget what it felt like when, you know, because heaven knows 36 years ago when I got married, but no matter how much you love them, there's that anxiety of, yeah. of I, I don't want to make the wrong decision. Right. I don't, you know, 
it's just, it's a lot. And, you know, I'm never going to go on another date again, you know, yeah. all the things. Right. Um, just trying to remember that with, it's, with the excitement also is a level in it of anxiety that you just got to navigate. It's, right. It's a lot. And then it, just planning a wedding and all the family pressures. Who's yeah. getting invited? Who's not getting invited? You know, what, this isn't a convenient time for me or I can do, and it just, it's a lot. Yeah. It is a lot. So yeah. and just to try and make it fun for them. And right. It's not easy to remember. No, no, it does. It goes by in a flash, right? Yeah, it does. I mean, it was great. I mean, yeah. we had a, a wonderful time and we're blessed. We have a wonderful son-in-law. Um, they're very happy together. And, Good. you know, we just keep praying that, you know, that, that it's, it's beneficial for both of them and that yeah. they keep each other in mind. So I can yeah. do and he gets he gets the Bob seal of approval. He got the Bob seal of approval. He is <laughs> he is a good good guy. Yeah, we like him. And even more, he got the approval of the siblings. So that's good. And in many ways, they are far harder than the two of us. <laughs> that's so, good. Yeah. Uh, well, Julie, thank you so much. It's yeah. been great. I I really appreciate it. Um, where can, you know, you mentioned something about people reaching out to you. Mm -hmm. You are really fantastic. You will always talk to lawyers and try to help them however you can. How can people get a hold of you? So um, you can either just hop on the website because you can get me right off our website, IndieBar.org. The whole staff listing is right there. Um, or, um, you know, Indie Bar HQ, which is our downtown headquarters. Um, I'm there every day. You know, stop in. Um, you know, the it is a private club environment for the members of the legal community. Um, Cause again, we're, we, the Indianapolis bar association serves the members, the members serve the public. So if you come down there and you're a member of the public general public, right. Um, we can't provide you with legal advice because right. none of us are lawyers. Um, but, um, but members of the, the legal community, yeah, come on down. Um, I, I know I, I can help you, but um, if you're a member of the public, I'll find somebody that could help you. Right. So come on down there or, um, you know, just, just email me. Um, I'm always on my email. So Jay Armstrong at indiebar.org. Yeah. So, and, and your email address is on the website. It's too. on the website, but yeah, yeah just Case Jay Armstrong, indiebar.org. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah. Well, um, uh, thank you so much, Julia. Oh, thanks for asking it. me. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, thanks for listening to uh, the Circle City Conversations podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any more future conversations. <laughs>